Now, officials from Moscow and Beijing are the first known foreign visitors to North Korea since the pandemic border closure. Then Pyongyang to mark 70 years since the signing of the Korean War armistice. Although it has largely held, it's never been replaced by a peace treaty, which means the two sides are still technically at war. It means tens of thousands of South Korean prisoners of war have been held captive in the North since the early 50s. A tiny number have managed to escape, but most are thought to have perished, as our Seoul correspondent G. McKenzie reports. Comes news that communist troops have invaded southern Korea. For three years, fighting engulfed the Korean peninsula. In the 70 years since, peace has eluded it. A set of documents is signed by General Harris. The delicate armistice, signed in 1953, has never been replaced by a peace treaty. And tens of thousands of captured South Korean soldiers have never been returned. Lee Dae-bong is one of the very few who managed to plot his own escape. He lost his fingers, not to war, but to the 54 years he was forced to work in a North Korean coal mine. We gave our entire youths to that coal mine. We had no rights. You must have missed home terribly. Who wouldn't? I was all alone and scared I could face a meaningless death at any moment. At what point did you give up hope that anybody was going to come for you? North Korea was saying it didn't have any prisoners of war, and so nobody wanted to question it. It seemed as if the South Korean government didn't want to make any efforts to retrieve us. South and North Korea are marking 70 years since the armistice. But for the prisoners of war, the battle is not over. They were branded outcasts in North Korea, left to perish in the mines. Few, if any, are still alive. But their children remain. Che Ain spent her childhood being beaten at school punished by association. She was six when her father was killed in a gas explosion at a North Korean mine. Only after his death did she find out he'd been a South Korean soldier. In that moment, I hated him. I blamed him so much for making us all suffer, she says. She too decided to escape North Korea and the misery of being an outcast. How do you feel about him now? Now I respect him and try so hard to remember him. I feel different to other North Korean defectors because I'm the proud daughter of a South Korean war veteran, she tells me. By the time Lee arrived home, already an old man, his parents had passed away, believing their son had been killed in action. The absence of peace between the North and South have left Lee and the families of these soldiers struggling to find peace of their own. Jean McKenzie, BBC News, Seoul. Well, I spoke to Young Gu Kim, who's the principal researcher at the East Asia Institute, and he told me the importance of the visits by, to North Korea by Russia and China. It proves that the the, after the war in Ukraine, the authoritarian regimes strengthened their uh, relationships and strengthened relations to uh, boost up uh, their uh, force to fight against the so-called like-minded groups, uh, countries that are led by the United States. So I think it still proves that looks like the Cold War is not ended on Korean Peninsula. Of course, recently, North Korea has been testing many missiles. It's been a while since their last nuclear test, but its military capabilities are definitely expanding. How concerned mm. are ordinary South Koreans? Well, you, we usually say it's a game changer if North Korea has both the miniature nuclear warheads and the solid fuel missiles. And that's why we worry about whether North Korea could develop ICBM missiles and solid fuel missiles, uh, which could launch in the reach at the U.S. continent. But that is already happening in South Korea. It actually happened in 2019. 
when North Korea showed its KN-23 missiles, which is liquid, I mean, solid fuel missiles that can carry nuclear warheads, that, which can fly up to 600 kilometers, which can hit any part of the South Korea at any time if they want. So uh, now we have to say that North Korea has capability to launch attack on any part of South Korean territory with nuclear warheads, and this is terrifying indeed. Of course. Uh, I remember back in 2018, during the Trump-Kim summit, uh, something like 70% of the South Korean public were eager to unite the two countries. Do you think that has changed uh, since the U.S. Uh, Pyongyang talks have stalled? Yes, actually, that was the highest point uh, when, after we did a survey on people's uh, you know, perception about the unification. And now, uh, according to the most recent uh, data uh, by the uh, collected by the Korean Institute for National Unification, um, now 53 percentage of people support for unification. So it's, the number is the lowest uh, ever since we uh, conducted a survey. And if we break down uh, these responses by age groups, like uh, the people who support for this unification drops from 66% to 39%, if the age group moves from 60s to 20s. So it looks like more young people don't want to be united.